Hello and welcome to the English translation of the talk why 3D printed clothing is not the future. Um, your translators for this evening are Duckman and Mary. Second question though. So questions are um, who's, who knows about 3D printed clothing and uh, who's done that before actually at home? So there's not a lot of, not a lot of uh, people who've done that before. And if so, it didn't work too well. But a lot of people have 3D printed. Who of them have thought about printing clothing actually at home? So about 10 people have thought about doing that at home. And our next speaker, Rebecca, will tell you now why that might not be the best idea to, to 3D print your clothing. You can find Rebecca on Twitter under, uh, w using her hand handle Kurfürstin and she's doing research at the intersection between usual clothing, the, the fact manufacturing of usual clothing, like everyday clothing, and she also does a lot of, she does the technical virtual clothing. So I have a lot of fun. Enjoy the talk. I hope you're going to have a lot of fun. Let's greet Rebecca with applause. Uh, I just received posts, but um, I'm not going to let that stop me from doing my talk. Welcome to my talk. Oh, more, more posts. There's a lot going on on that stage right now. I'm going to read that later, but um, I'm happy that the post office seems to be working well. So my talk is called Why 3D Printed Clothing is not the future and I'm going to talk about the, the what what makes 3D printed clothing and um, why it why it's like that and what needs to be done to make it everyday usable. So I'm a clothing technician which is maybe a weird combination of words. So when clothing is manufactured, on the one side we have the design, the, the idea, and to put that into a real thing, that's a whole different thing. So for example, we have a person who comes up with a design, they, they design a dress and have a nice picture of it, you can see some things but not, not too much, and they go to production to to a company um, and tell them make the stress place and they're like okay how how we need a lot of information to do that and everyone's like what and yeah that's where it stops because the production needs to know what kind of fabric do we need um, what kind of sizes do you need how many do you need um, how many in which size what kind of machines do we need what to put under on the care instructions how far is the distance between um, between different parts of the dress and that's where where I come in like I'm, I'm in between the design and the production so I kind of do the reality check what can you what can be done how can it be done so it's a lot about of about materials about quality where to produce it prices when to produce it all of these question have questions have to be resolved and that's what my job is so uh, this I uh, applied this reality check how can this even be done to 3d printing and if you have a look in the internet for 3d printing and clothing then you can see all these headlines 
Uh, about some news. Oh, 3D printing will bring a lot of flexibility into the fashion industry or clothing of the future or is the street dress of the future from the 3D printer or can the 3D printer completely revolutionize fashion? A few years ago it was even worse. Oh yeah, 2020 we'll all have a printer at home and in the morning we'll print a pullover and in the evening we'll melt it down and print a new one. But they got a bit careful over time. But uh, you can see even from these headlines that there is a lot of hope involved here, that something may change radically, that the fashion industry will be unrecognizable, and there is a lot of sustainability in there, and uh, sustainability has become uh, a big topic in the clothing industry, and, well... I'm going to talk about that. Uh, 3D printed clothing actually exists. It's nothing new, nothing special, not completely unrealistic. There have been complete fashion collections that have been 3D printed. I'll show you three small examples. For example, the creations of Dani Peleg. They, uh, her final collection in Israel was made completely via 3D printer. It was a five-part collection. There's, for example, this two-part ensemble to the right a top and a floor-length skirt, and the skirt was printed completely with desktop 3D printers, which means it's made of modules that have about A4 size, and they're stuck together to form the skirt. The special thing about it is that it's, it moves very well and is very flexible because it's made from flexible filament, but also because it has this zigzag structure, structure that uh, enables the parts to move over each other when you pull on them. Uh, it really jumps and puffs up a bit where you pull on it. The jacket you see there is the first 3D printed ready-to-wear piece of clothing that you can order online. It's uh, limited to 100 pieces. And if you want to buy it, you can do that for $1,500. You can uh, make some decisions like uh, change the color, put some writing on the back, and then it takes about 100 hours to print, and then you have a jacket. Another example is from the design collective Nervous Systems, the kinematic system. It's made out of triangles that are stuck together with hinges. So uh, the whole surface is flexible, it can be moved, but it's made from hard material. So there's like a hard, solid plastic. It moves, it rattles a bit if it moves, if you run. And after a while, they uh, made a version that uh, is proof against spying eyes. The dress on the right is made of these triangles, but has little flower petals printed on it, so that it can't be looked through. The third example is this. It is the pangolin dress. It's made of a structure of different modules that can uh, move into one another and overlap when moving. And that allows uh, limited flexibility. So you can move in this dress and the surface will follow your movement. Uh, Travis Fitch was uh, working on this uh, designer working in New York and I talked to him a bit. I am a clothing technician. I asked, yeah, can I have numbers? And uh, where do you even get the information that these structures can be used for just what makes you say yeah okay this is elastic enough to use it as clothing do you do lab testing and he was more like yeah uh, I, I pull on it and it's either good or it isn't and so then the clothing technician in me uh, sort of burst through and I thought hey what are my numbers and so I offered him to examine these structures do lab testing to find out What's behind all this? What are the aspects of this in numbers and units? How can you express that? So those were three of many examples. Uh, at fashion shows on the runway, there are a lot more. And it's, of course, clear that uh, these aren't exactly everyday examples. They're, these are clothes for a special occasion, custom-made, can take months to build, made of 300-whatever parts that have to be stuck together. But the question is, will this revolutionize fashion? So uh, th that obviously has to apply to everyday stuff. 
custom fit stuff at fashion shows does not in directly revolutionize everyday wear. So my question is, what does this clothing have to do or have to be able to do to be everyday wear that we can wear literally every day and for every occasion? And to me, at this point, it's the most important part is that uh, clothing has to be comfortable. Um, we, can, we can express that through comfort, wearing comfort. There's um, the psychological part of that, which is about trends and individual individuality, and that I'm, I'm kind of individualizing myself. Wearing a hoodie might fit here, but um, at maybe maybe a more different context would would ask for a different clothing. And so, you, it, in this context, you might feel very comfortable in, in one kind of clothing, which you wouldn't wear in a different context. And that's the psychological part. Then there's the next to skin comfort. Um, it can be, it can be so soft or kind of itchy or scratchy. It can cause allergic reactions. There's the physiological comfort which is about um, about the climate, kind of like your body climate. It has to keep you warm, but at the same time, it has to transport your sweat kind of to the outside, and um, so it can. This evaporation must happen through the clothing. So, and some clothing does this a lot better than others, and it's important for us being comfortable in our clothing. And the fourth aspect is uh, the ergonomics of the whole thing. Uh, that's mostly about freedom of movement, and that's kind of uh, the thing I focused on. And the freedom of movement comes, uh, on the one hand, uh, how the, f the clothing fits, how tight, how loose it is, and uh, secondarily through elasticity of the material used. And that's extremely important, since there are parts of the body, for example, the knees and the elbows, where you have to have a stretch of at least 50% if you want to perform any sort of useful movement. And to do that, uh, the clothing has to be elastic and not break. If the material used in this place is not elastic, then the surface would either bow out or distort. So if you have a very tight sleeve and the material isn't elastic, and I do this all the time, then it'll sort of take that shape at that point and uh, it won't look nice. So we need a material that sort of springs back into its original shape once we straighten out our arm. So if the surface isn't elastic at all, it isn't actually that good for clothing uses. But you can compensate for this with cut. If the uh, piece of clothing is wider, it's uh, the lack of elasticity is not as significant. So uh, my question was, how can I find out how these or how elastic these three D printed structures are? If I can do that, then I can use them consciously in a targeted way to significantly raise the ergonomics and comfort of 3D printed clothing and bring it closer to everyday usability. And if you look at textile surfaces, uh, like the ones that we wear every day, the, they implement the elasticity. Then there's two aspects. The material itself may be elastic. It's usually called elastan. It's awesome. You can stretch it by 300% and it'll spring back. And it's used in many, many pieces of clothing. So a usual uh, mix ratio is 98% cotton, 2% elastan. And those 2% are enough for the shirt to be movable enough to get in there. It can be very tight, but it won't deform or anything after wear. The second option is via structure, structural elasticity, and that is usually done via weaving. And uh, if you pull on a surface, 
then the threads will move and they will move relative to each other and distribute a bit of their thread to their neighbors. And that uh, in combination makes an elastic surface with material that isn't all that elastic. Cotton fiber, for example, isn't elastic at all, but uh, if you weave it the right way, it's a very movable and elastic surface. And if you transfer this to 3D printed surfaces, then you can use an elastic material here, for example, TPU, that's thermoplastic polyurethane, and polyurethane is used in elastan. So it has very similar aspects and because it is based on the same chemical ground rules. Structural elasticity is possible. Via, uh, you can print uh, a weave, but you can also use other shapes such as uh, arches, spirals, springs, things you can compress or pull on. So that at first you distort the tr structure and not the material. The kind of things you can do with that depends on uh, your printing technology. There are different ones and not all are uh, the same for making fashion. For my research, I specialized on two processes. So for the one, on the one hand, um, I did the FLM, the method which uh, melts filament, so it, it, it's, it's thermoplastic, so it's it's heated up and then it get it melts and it's liquid and then you can you can design a geometry using that and if you if you have an object with that kind of hangs over like you see on the left you need you need um, some pillars to to help that stand and that structure like the pillar structure needs needs to be built from the beginning and is in the finished object and you have to remove it afterwards that's no problem if it's if it's a hard enough material you can just break it off but if it's elastic you can really break it off if you pull on it it just elongates and you don't really win anything so if you if you try to to build geometries like that with with an overhang um, that method doesn't really work for it you you don't win it any time or or get any get anything out of it out of the method like that I didn't catch good idea but it doesn't work with the TPU uh, for other technologies you have uh, BPA which can be dissolved in water but uh, those structures don't really fit together TPU needs a very high temperature to melt I printed that stuff at 215 C but the PVA already started decomposing from the temperature so uh, theoretically a good idea but uh, right now what's possible with these printers, yeah, it, it, it doesn't fit yet. I am of good hope that something new will be developed, but yeah. The other process is SLS, Selective Laser Sintering. It's a powder-based printing process where you put layers of powder into your build space and use a laser beam to melt the grains of the powder together where you need your geometry and then you add another layer of powder and so on. So the powder itself is your support material and you can do away with all those columns. You At the end you have filled your complete build space with powder and somewhere in there is the structure you printed. And that powder can be easily removed later and reused. For my research, I tested a variety of different structures. The left and the center one are made with uh, SLS. So I had the possibility to add a bit of height. Uh, to uh, chain things together and I did that in different sizes the la uh, larger and a smaller variant and the smaller variant is obviously a lot more mobile you can really fold that up nicely and move it and these little modules 
uh, can be moved relative to each other, you can push them together, and that makes it all very mobile. With the other process, I was limited in uh, my design choice, so it's a bit simpler. This one is based uh, on a diamond pattern that has been extruded into three-dimensional space. And at first, the uh, diamond structure is stretched before the material actually moves. I had this in d with different variants, uh, big diamonds, small diamonds, different layer heights, to uh, see which variant has which uh, elastic properties, so that it can be decided which factor is the deciding one for the elasticity values I get. How can you even test the, these uh, values? By pulling on it. You take a sample strip, something like this, uh, put it into your testing machine, and the machine will pull on it with a constant speed. But the, and the software that works with the machine spits out a little diagram. You can see it on the right. And the diagram shows you the change in length in percent, so uh, how much it has been distorted, and the force used. So you can use the diagrams to uh, how resistant it, the material is against tearing and how much it can be distorted without springing back uh, and spring back. Uh, stretching and elastic stretching is not the same thing. But if I pull on something and, and I stretch it, it's going to st uh, keep its shape because I overstressed it. But if it's elastic enough, it will spring back into the original shape. Those are two different numbers that can both be derived from this diagram. I did that with all my different variants. And you, of course, you have to do multiple samples and average them out and everything. And then I got numbers and units. And so I had these numbers. So, one thing I have to know is, are those good numbers? Are those bad numbers? And for that, there is a recommendation by Dialog Textil Bekleidung, together with the German Fashion Association. It's not an international standard, it's not a law. So, clothing doesn't have to reach these values, but is a recommendation how clothing should behave and what forces uh, it should be able to tolerate. This is a small part of that, uh, split by product groups like uh, pants have to survive different things compared to underpants, and if it's uh, a bit looser, then you need uh, less pulling force, because if it's further from the body, it, uh, it's not important how much is pulled, it doesn't have to conform as well. So I compared these numbers and found out uh, the amount of force needed to permanently distort uh, my structures was okay, but the maximum force before failure was not okay. So I can pull on the thing, that's awesome, but it's very easy to pull too hard and rip it apart. So yeah, they, they are flexible, but the forces, if, if I uh, uh, move my arm and the thing rips, then uh, the piece of clothing doesn't help me much. These 3D printed structures are limited in that sense. Then I want to have a look at the factors that uh, actually cause this to be elastic or not, or how much. And what I saw from my numbers is that the size of my elements uh, did have an influence, so the larger variants had better values than the smaller ones, but the big ones don't really look or feel all that much like fabric. But the small, the small ones are closer, but it didn't get as good numbers. And then there was another factor, which was the slicing program. And the slicing program has two significant uh, jobs. First of all, it splits my 3D object up into layers. And second of all, it tells the 3D printer where it's supposed to be in which layer with the print head. So if you print a vase like this, the lowest layer will be completely filled because you want to pour water in there and it's not supposed to leak out. 
So the path from the printhead, or the path of the printhead could look roughly like this. It would go back and forth in rows to fill everything completely. The second layer would be a ring, and the printer might be doing something like this. Maybe it will take another path, though. There is a lot of different programs. And uh, they are limited in their configurability. And I had a closer look at it and saw that uh, with my diamond structures, the printhead took a fairly particular path. It went uh, over to this crossing and then back in another direction. Under the microscope, you can see that it tore exactly here. The printer didn't actually traverse the crossing, so all the strands are just ever so slightly melted together. Whenever a new hot strand came their way, it sort of stuck to the other. But the strand didn't actually bridge the gap, so that's sort of uh, my f point of failure. And that's where it tore apart. In another variant, which is based on basically the same pattern, the slicing program decided to do it differently. We c it decided to go right to the bend in the middle of the diamond. So, of course, the uh, fracture point is now there. And the samples look different because they tore in a different place. And that explains my <laughs> low yield strength because I'm not actually pulling on the solid material but on the places where it's just sort of stuck together a bit. And depending on how well that happened, this can be easier or harder. So, um, the method itself, it itself already makes, um, makes the strength kind of low. So I've tested eight structures using different variants. So you could ask now, how do you come up with the idea that now 3D printed clothing isn't a good idea and that other things um, might be better? And I say, well, it could be, and depending on the method you use, there's there's boundaries to to what, how far you can get. So here we have to take a closer look, actually, onto molecules on the molecules itself. So different different strings have have different different they have different tensile strengths due to the way the molecules are arranged uh, so we have either amorphous or crystalline areas and those that the squiggles to the right they are supposed to be chains of molecules and where they're sort of tangled together a bit like a plate of spaghetti they're not exactly that stable in the areas where they're very ordered they are very solid. And the natural fiber have a tendency to be or to have a high amount of internal order. Many crystalline areas, they are very solid. They have a high tensile strength uh, from the get-go that my structures do not have. And if we're looking at synthetics, then you can influence how hard they are to tear. There's different... Uh, technologies to make fibers and at least one of them is very close to 3D printing in which you liquefy or the plastic or the material that you want to use as a fiber and you press it through a nozzle and it turns into a fiber there. It's very similar to 3D printing. The difference is that uh, you can influence what properties the fiber has at the end. The degree of crystallization, so how much of the thing is crystalline, is dependent on how fast it cools. The slower you cool, cool the fiber, the more time the molecule chains have to go into an ordered state. So these spinning machines are heated for uh, to cause the cooling to be as slow as possible, to get a degree of crystallization that is as high as possible, and hence a tensile strength that is as high as possible. We do not have this possibility with 3D printing. We can use a heated print bed, but that only influences the first one or two layers, maybe, and nothing after that. And after the strand has been deposited, we want it to harden as fast as possible, since uh, it might just run off to the side, and we want to have a certain geometry that we decide we want it to have. 
it's not supposed to flow apart once it's been printed. And uh, when the next layer is added, well, that only works if the layer below it has already hardened. So we can't just keep the thing at a constantly high temperature all the time. With the uh, SLS printing, it's a bit different. It's uh, better for making high tensile strength materials, and the structures had significantly better results as far as tensile strength goes. With synthetic fiber, we have another possibility, which is stretching them. After they've been spun, they are shoved through rollers, and these rollers pull on them, they apply a pulling force, and that. Uh, raises the degree of crystallization because the molecules are aligned and forced to align to each other. Uh, this also leads to the fiber becoming slightly thinner and it becomes finer, softer, but more solid. That explains why uh, textile fibers are so much uh, more solid than, uh, uh, but still much finer than what comes out of a 3D printer. Textile fibers uh, can also warm you very well by trapping air for insulation purposes. You get these little chambers due to the weave, and uh, those can warm us. And that's because textile surfaces are made of threads. These threads are made of fibers. And as you can see on this uh, microscope image, it's this is not some rough carpet. This is a microscopic image of a very small piece of cloth. You couldn't even see this with your eye. But in all these little holes, air can be trapped, and uh, you'll be warm by it. The small distances are also possible, uh, important for transporting moisture, because uh, sweat can evaporate and go through them, so the clothing can warm you and protect you from overheating. And structure, small fine structures like this can't be made by 3D printing. We are very limited in fineness and we can't just print tiny air chambers. We're uh, still quite limited in that. So, there's a couple things that 3D printed structures just can't do. But there's other things that they can do. So we can we, we have a lot of freedom of choice and when we design a thing. So, um, things like bracelets or necklaces or glasses, we, we have a lot of freedom to design that. Or for costumes in the movie, exam for example, um, Black Panther, they pr 3D printed the crowns, which is one example what you could do with that method. So, you only, you only build up material where you need it, which is, which is very sustainable. Uh, in in normal clothing manufacturing, if you cut um, a pattern from fabric, you you usually have like 10% loss of the fabric, which is not a good thing. You lose a lot of fabric there. So this is one of the good aspects of 3D printing clothing. Um, and you can actually recycle the materials very well, which is another downside of the normal clothing industry. It's very well suited to, to, to fabricate individual pieces, one, one of a kind pieces, and you can have one product with different different properties in different parts of the clothing. So you could make it thicker, for example, around the shoulder if you want it more stable there. Um, and if you would try to do that with the usual way with fabric, you would have to use different fabric there or added fabric. And you couldn't just print it in one go, like with 3D printing. You could also integrate cables, LEDs, some sort of sensors. But, well, there's a question mark behind this because it's not really everyday stuff. 
and uh, we can't yet get that in such an advanced state that it's standard. Uh, one advantage could be that you can make the entire piece of clothing in one single step. Uh, right now, you have to first make the fabric, cut the fabric, sew it together, maybe dye it. Those are all different steps happening in different places. And uh, if I 3D print a piece of clothing, then I could just do it uh, in a once-through process. But only if it actually fits into the printer's build space. So if you print an A4 sheet and uh, stick many of those back together, then we're right back where we started, where things have to be built out of components. Uh, something a bit more complex is this thing uh, Nova Systems developed, which is a software that digitally folds the dress and it is printed in a folded state, which reduces the build space uh, significantly. So somewhere in this powder block you have the dress and you have to sort of archaeological free it from the remnants of powder, clean it and uh, unfold it. But it's, it's a nice way of uh, using the advantage of 3D printing of everything happening in one step. Mm, but aside from that, I still see significant problems. There are also disadvantages or challenges, such as uh, the tensile strength or lack thereof, which is uh, a feature of the process itself. We're limited as far as fine structures go, so the standard nozzle diameter is 0.4 millimeters, and with fibers we're looking at micrometers. Those are significant differences, and fineness is important for uh, how something feels on your skin, for transporting uh, moisture, for warming via entrapped air, and that is so elementary that these four aspects of uh, comfort just are not happening if the piece of clothing is 3D printed. Time and cost is looking very bad. It takes quite a long while to print and it's very expensive. So this isn't every day yet. This is custom jobs. Uh, how to wash or clean one of those things is... Uh, has to, that has to still be determined, uh, how you wash it. And if we're talking about clothing, we have to talk about how do you close it. You have to get in there somewhere, so there have to be zippers, buttons, hooks, eyelets. You have to think about that sort of thing if you want to print the whole thing once through. So building fabrics from fibers, uh, from threads which are made from fibers, right now is not uh, to be beat as far as comfort goes, and there are no real solutions for imitating it, either the, via 3D printing or some other process, or some other arrangement of material on, in a different way. This hasn't been solved yet. That means that uh, right now, state-of-the-art, 3D printed clothing is not only not the future, but not even today, because uh, today our stuff is made of textile fibers, and it works really well, but 3D printed structures just can't do that yet. That doesn't mean we should stop looking at the problem, and uh, whoever said that would work well, uh, I'm interested in what worked well, and if there are maybe other aspects involved that uh, I didn't think about here. But uh, it shouldn't be forgotten that uh, the basic or the basic function of clothing shouldn't be forgotten. This uh, art I showed in the beginning is awesome, and I think it's the best thing ever. And research on that sort of thing should be done. But clothing is supposed to warm us, and it's supposed to protect against prying eyes, and it's supposed to keep our body climate optimal. My hope that with a sustainable process we could maybe revolutionize the entire industry industry or through other, that we could do that through uh, new uh, production processes. That's a bit uh, problematic since the fashion industry is highly problematic. There are many problems, uh, ecologically, societal problems. And putting your hope in a new technology and saying, yeah, this will solve everything because it's sustainable and then we're just going to print everything with a 3D printer and the sustainability problem will be solved. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, I'm not seeing that. Mm, so, yes, please do the research, but don't forget the basic function. 
and don't just sort of rest on your laurels that this new innovative technology will solve everything. So uh, revolutionize the clothing industry in all other aspects as well and don't depend on 3D printing solving all the world's problems. And this I'm done with my presentation and thank you for listening. This has been the C3 Dingo English translation of the talk Why do 3D Printing is Not the Future. Your translators were Mary and ja, Duckman. Uh, for your information, there will be no Q&A since this talk ended basically at just the right second. Uh, you can ask uh, better things on Twitter, for example, at Kurfürsten. Uh, and you could probably catch her somewhere after the talk. Um, as far as the translation, translation goes, uh, we accept feedback at the email address hello at c3lingo.org or you can Twitter using the hashtag c3lingo.